That was amazing. Uh, my, uh, my name is Ben Fuquay. Uh, I'm the Life Stage 2 pastor. Basically, Ted was lazy this morning and he asked me if I would preach. That's uh, how that kind of works. Just kidding. Don't fire me, Ted. Just kidding. Um, I, uh, I'm normally obligated in other areas at this church that I love, love, love so much. I've been on staff here for 10 years. Uh, I think one of my favorite things about getting to preach um, on this pulpit outside of you, outside of the Word of God, outside of what the Spirit of God does, is maybe this, uh, the fact that it gives me an excuse to be in this room, because that was powerful. Uh, my, yes. <clears throat> my mom used to sing that song over me before I went to bed, Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. That's what I'm going to talk about this morning. Is that okay with you guys? We're going to talk about the deep, deep love of Jesus. I am so, so honored. Uh, to be here, to get to open up God's Word. Cody, several months ago, asked me, uh, we're in this, this series uh, Q&A, uh, questions that we can't avoid, and he said, hey, Ben, would you preach uh, week two? <clears throat> and so I, I looked at it, I looked at the passage, I wrestled with it, and, and looked at the question that we're going to be asking, and, uh, and I'm honored, because what we're going to talk about today is exactly that, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Uh, so if you would, grab your Bibles and flip to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, that's page 8, 12, if you've got the blue Bibles under your seats. And while you're turning there, I want to tell you a story. A few weeks ago was Easter, and so my wife and I, we have two boys. We've got a a four-and-a-half-year-old named Charlie, and we've got a -a one-and-a-half-year-old named Miles. Uh, They are cute. You might have kids, and you might have grandkids, but my kids are cuter than yours. Uh, apologize. We can arm wrestle after or compare pictures afterwards. Um, and so the grandparents came into my backyard and we put eggs everywhere, right? We got the plastic Easter eggs with, uh, with all kinds of candy and treats that my wife and I had, had uh, filled earlier in the day. And so after church that evening, we, uh, we, we put them all over the yard and, um, and we spread them out. We put them in trees and under the slide and in the bushes. <clears throat> and then after dinner, we, we opened the back door We've got two kids. Uh, They're the only grandkids in the family, so all of the family comes to our house, and they just spoil my two kids. They run around and gather eggs, and Charlie and Miles filled their baskets. I mean, just filled their baskets with all these plastic eggs, and then they all went inside, (laughs) and we watched them. We watched them start opening them. And, you know, and and Charlie, the (coughs) four-and-a-half-year-old, excuse me, the four-and-a-half-year-old, he starts opening it up, and he starts seeing, uh, yeah, could I? (coughs) Excuse me. Ted got me sick probably earlier. You can't hang out with him too long or you'll just start getting a cough and sick. <coughs> Thanks for muting my mic on that last cough. They, they thank you too. All right, <clears throat> lesson learned. Don't hang out with Ted. Okay, so Charlie. Charlie's popping open eggs left and right. And there's candy and there's jelly beans and there's dinosaurs, little plastic dinosaurs we put in there. And uh, he's just having a good time. His eyes are getting big and each new egg he pops open. It's a treat, it's a treat. And then my wife and I did something that we thought was pretty responsible. We put in some of the plastic eggs some things that are healthy. Some almonds, some baby carrots, you know, some things that are healthy for our children. Yeah, yeah, you know where this is going. So my son pops open an egg, and it's a baby carrot. And it was like I had betrayed him. (laughs) He looked at me with just, it wasn't even anger at first, it was disbelief. It was, are you kidding me? Is this a joke, Dad? And then almost kind of this look of like, why would you do this? I trusted you, Dad. Why would you waste this egg? And I just thought, well, it's a baby carrot. It's healthy. And honestly, it's not because we're healthy. It's because we're cheap. And we had a lot of extra baby carrots. But he starts popping them open. And he, he gets past, pops open, gets an almond. Same thing. What in the world? You're wasting eggs. Open, open, pop another baby carrot. And my son has not talked to me since Easter because of that. (laughs) So you guys pray for the few quays. I'm just kidding. Uh, Here's why I tell you that story. Here's why I tell you that story. I tell you that story because uh, I think that that visual of my son popping open open these eggs, there's a surprise there. Right? He opens them up and, and a lot of times it's good. But you don't know what's inside that. You don't know what's inside of that. And there is a very real and very sobering reality that we are going to be opened up one day. We're going to be revealed. Uh, We're going to stand before the Lord and we're going to be revealed. And there's a question of what is going to be revealed in us. What is going to be revealed in us when we are opened before the Lord? 
Is this something we're excited about? Is this something that we believe? Or, or are we going to be surprised? Hebrews 9.27 says, And just as it is appointed for a man to die once, and after that comes judgment. One day, folks, we will stand before the Lord. And a question I think we have to ask ourselves is, what is he going to find? What is he going to find, and will it be enough? Look at Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. Verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This visual of us being an egg opened up before the Lord, what's he going to find? Are we confident in what's he going to find? This is, I think, perhaps one of the most unsettling passages in the New Testament to me. <clears throat> Here there is many people, many people, and these people, I mean, they, were, they had the appearance of varsity Christianity. I mean, the things that they were saying, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons and many mighty works in your name. And what does the Lord say? He looks at these people and he says, I, I never knew you. Depart from me. I don't know you. You've done all of these mighty works, but the Lord does not know them. They are asking in. They are expecting in. They had clearly spent their lives doing a lot of things for God. And yet, they're not let in. We don't want to be left out. We don't want to be surprised. And the beautiful thing is we can know. We can know. We can have confidence. So let's not miss it. And so the question we're asking in this series of questions and answers is a question that I believe is eternally important. It's the question this morning, how good do you have to be? How good do you have to be to get in? To get to heaven, to spend eternity with the Lord, how good do you have to be? Uh, let's look at how the world would answer that question first. Uh, the world and every other religion makes the claim good people go to a better place when they die. Good people, they go to a better place when they die. And that seems almost intuitive, right? Good people go to heaven, uh, bad people don't. Uh, it seems almost like this intuitive thing. Our culture, I think, would all support that. But let's evaluate. Let's evaluate the standard of what is good enough it differs between all the major world religions. Let me explain. So uh, Buddhists, they would have one path of, of reaching nirvana and enlightenment. Uh, the Islamic faith has a different path of how you're able to reach the afterlife. Uh, Mormons, they would claim Jesus, but then they would add to salvation. Uh, all throughout different major religions, there's different paths of what it means to be good enough. Cody told me a story this last week. He was on a mission trip um, not too long ago, I think, and uh, he went to a, a, a temple. He, he was in a foreign country, and he went to this temple, and outside of this temple, there was this long pathway, the stone pathway with steps, and, and leading up to this, it was about 100 yards long, leading up to this, this temple of, of worship, <clears throat> there was a, a woman on this hundred-yard stone path, an elderly woman on her knees, walking into the temple on her knees, her fragile knees, causing her excruciating pain just to move this hundred yards up stone steps, across pathways, up more steps. And when asked what was happening was, this was her way of earning it. This was this good work that she had to do to take these painful steps on her knees to humble herself in that way so that she might be able to enter in to worship. And here's the problem. Um, although all the other worldviews, they seem to suggest that we should work, you know, we should work hard enough or we should meditate correctly or long enough or we should do good enough, the standard for good enough is, is different. The standard for what is good enough is different. And so maybe you say, well, they're all right. Or maybe you know someone who says, well, there's lots of paths and they all lead. And, and maybe that's your question here this morning too. And you just have assumed that some people are Christians and they'll go the Christian path and some people are uh, of the Muslim faith and they'll go the Muslim path. And there's lots of paths and they all lead to the same place. Um, let's talk about that for a second. Because the reality is uh, we believe that there is objective truth. We believe that 
there is objective truth. And the problem is that truth claims like salvation and the existence of God and how to approach God, those are objective truth claims. And at the point that we attempt to make truth relative, to just change and tweak truth to however we feel most comfortable is the point that we have to give up logic. Now, there's some things that are subjective, right? So, for example, I love tacos. I think tacos are delicious. They are delicious. They are amazing. They are one of God's gifts to us to help stir our hearts for worship. The only thing that would be better than Josh and this choir and orchestra and band to stir my heart would be Josh, this, this choir, this orchestra, and a taco in the front row. That would be better. That would stir our hearts for affection. Right, I believe that. Right, I, th- I think, but you know what? That's subjective. I think they're delicious. There are lots of other people who don't think they're delicious. I pray for those people every day. <clears throat> if you are one of those people, come forward afterwards. We'll pray. No, I'm just kidding. Don't come forward and pray for tacos. Don't fire me, Ted. That wasn't appropriate. <clears throat> tacos are subjective. Right? I might arrogantly pretend that tacos are this great thing, but we all know that's a subjective opinion. However, there is objective truth. And so claims like all roads lead, there is objective realities. Um, if I were to tell you that this pen is a black pen, this is black ink in this pen, and Ted were to say it's a blue pen, and someone over here were to say we're both right, we might be able to figure out who's right between Ted and I by investigating, and, but we know right off the bat that this person's wrong because we're making two objective claims about the same thing. <clears throat> Jesus makes an exclusive claim. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Um, so maybe we don't even attempt that, right? Maybe we, we realize, okay, that it can't be that all paths lead there. There must be a right, there must be a wrong. Maybe it's not that all paths lead there. Maybe we just say we, we have to check our internal moral gauge for what is good enough. How do we know what's good enough? How do we know that we won't be surprised when we're revealed, when we're opened up. Well, we just need to be good enough, and so we, we just check that with our own conscience. The problem with that is our, our conscience changes. What is good, what is right, what is, it's, a, it's a moving target. It, look at our culture. You've seen it. What was acceptable in films 20 years ago, what was unacceptable in films 20 years ago, is now par for the course. When you look at the rating systems, you look at what's allowed to be on television or in films or published, what is good is a moving target. Even for ourselves, it is a moving target that we can't trust. It is like trying to hold water in our hands. We cannot get our grip on what the world says is good. The world claims good people go to a better place when they die, but how can that be true if good is a moving target? How can that be true if good is this moving target? So what about scriptures? What about the scriptures? What do they say? The Old Testament, God makes it really clear. God reveals who he is and how we are to approach him and the standard. He says in Leviticus 11.4, he says, Be holy for I am holy. The God of the universe sets the standard right off the bat. He says, be holy for I am holy. And all through the pages of Scripture, all through the pages of Scripture, it becomes quite clear that God is a holy and perfect God and that he has set a standard for us to be holy. So how good do you have to be? How good do you have to be? You have to be holy. The Bible says the standard required is perfection. Even the New Testament. Even in the New Testament, we see that perfection again as Jesus in Matthew 5 Verse 20, he he says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Do we understand who Jesus is talking to here? Jesus is talking about the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes and the Pharisees were people who were professional do-gooders. They were professional law keepers. They were professional doing the good works of Scripture, making sure they followed the laws and followed the rules and didn't break the rules. And here Jesus points to them and says, if, if your righteousness doesn't exceed them, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. How good do we have to be? We have to be holy as he is holy. The standard is, the standard is God. The standard is perfection. 
which we are not. Which we are not, and that is also made very obviously clear throughout Scripture. Romans 3, 10 through 12 says, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. 1 John 1.8 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Isaiah 64.6 says, We have all become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. Another translation says, Filthy rags. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Our, Our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. Our best works, our best days, in comparison to the holiness and perfection of God, are filthy rags. Folks, we can't be good enough. We can't be good enough. The truth and reality of Scripture is that we can't be good enough. And yet, and yet this is something for me and for most of this room is not new to us. This is not a new revelation to us. This is something we've heard. We know where this is going. We know what it's going to point to. We've told it to other people. We've heard this a thousand times. We can't be good enough. We're not righteous enough. Yes, 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 yes. And yet, I'm a 35-year-old pastor who is, preaches this, and yet I look at my life and my wheels spin with this performance mentality. I look at my life and I think, well, I just need to do better. I just need to do better and then I'll, I'll earn more favor from God. Even in the preparation of this sermon, there's this lie in the back of my head that it becomes this default. I, I forget so quickly and it becomes this default. Well, if I work really hard on this and preach this really good sermon, well, then God might love me a little bit more. I might be a little bit closer to being enough. Do you do that? Do you who know this truth, know where we're going with this, still find in yourself this performance mentality? You still wonder. You read Matthew 7, you think, oh, am I going to be good enough? I think I live a pretty good life. I think I've done some good things, and I go to church. and I... There is a performance mentality that we still spin our wheels. We run on the treadmill of performance to try to earn it, but we cannot. We cannot. So, so what's our hope? What is our hope? It's why this truth, um, that we're not good enough, uh, it's why this is not the most discouraging sermon ever preached at Christ Chapel. It's why the truth that we're not good enough is not the biggest downer of your day. It's instead the truth that pushes you to the most life-giving, abundant, worshipful, peaceful, joyful life possible. And that's because the truth that I am not good enough puts me at my only hope, which is the grace of God. The only hope we have is the grace of God. Grace is this idea of receiving what I don't deserve. Romans 11, 5 and 6 says, so too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace, Paul says. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. We're not saved by works, we're saved by this grace. And even more specifically, we know our hope is the grace of God, but then even more specifically, we don't just put our hope in a benevolent God who's going to give us a pass. His grace became flesh. Our hope is not just in a benevolent God, it's in the person of Jesus. Our hope has a heartbeat, a heartbeat that is still beating and standing next to the Father interceding for us. The person of Jesus is our hope. It is the manifestation of God's grace. Acts 4.12 says, And there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Why? We've heard this, right? Yes, Jesus is our hope. We can't do it on our own, but why? Because Jesus was perfect. Because Jesus lived the perfect life. He lived the life that we were called to live and died the death that we deserved. Uh, I'm going to put two words up here on the screen, um, get a little nerdy with you, if I will. Now, I feel like I'm pretty good at reading my audience. I feel like I'm talking to a crowd that's really into tattoos, potentially. So, um, 
I, I spend a lot of time, I spend a lot of time with young adults. And, um, and, and you're, if you're into tattoos, I love that. I am not cool enough to get a tattoo. I have yet to be cool enough. I'm still working on that. Uh, but, but a lot of young adults, and, and I think it's a beautiful thing there, they will get Bible verses tattooed on their arms or things to remind them of who God is. And people get tattoos for all kinds of reasons. So my dare is if you are a tattoo person, I want the next tattoo you get to be this word, substitutionary atonement. That's what I want to see. I want to see the tattoos parlors start having the word substitutionary atonement because it is beautiful. And I want to be reminded of it. Just like you'd get a little Christian fish or you'd put substitutionary atonement is this beautiful, beautiful thing. It's Christ's victory and life traded for my debt and death. Christ's victory, his life traded for my debt and my death. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. 1 Peter 3.18, he trades his righteousness for our filthy rags. That substitutionary atonement, he trades what is broken in me for what is good in him. That Easter egg surprise that I open, instead of it being a disaster, instead of being this disappointing surprise, he trades what is disappointing and gives us what is good. Imputation. <clears throat> Imputation is another beautiful word. These words shouldn't just be academic. They should be a part of our worship. Imputation is the idea that we are given Christ's righteousness. That is amazing. That should stir our heart to worship. We are given Christ's righteousness for our sake. 2 Corinthians 5 says this. It says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We have his righteousness. Scripture says we have his righteousness. Now God is not tricked. God is not deceived, but when God looks at our life, you know what he sees? Well, let me look at Ben's life here. Let's see the life. He's, oh, he walked on water. Okay. Oh, he fed 5,000 people. Whoa, okay. We get Christ's life on us. Jesus is more than our example. He is our Savior. Jesus, Jesus has to be more than our religious affiliation. Right? He is our daily hope for this. And so if this is true... If this is true, if we cannot do it on our own, if, if we are far from him without Jesus, then he is our hope. What is our response? First response is we admit it. The first response is simple. We admit it. We admit this. We admit that you can't be good enough on your own. <clears throat> I, I think this is something that we've heard a thousand times, a lot of us in this room. And yet... I would, I would say easily, well, of course I admit it. Yeah, of course I do. I, I know that. I learned that in Sunday school. My, my mom saying, oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus over me. I grew up knowing this. And yet then I look at my life and I say, well, wait a second. That doesn't match with how I'm, how I'm living, how I'm walking, how I'm trying to perform and earn this. Jesus did not love you and go to the cross for you because you're good enough. Jesus loved you and went to the cross for you because you're not good enough. There's so much freedom in that. Do we see it? Do you see it in your life? And then do you receive it? We receive Jesus' perfection through faith in him. We receive that perfection through our faith in him. Titus 3, verses 4 through 7. This is, uh, this is so good. I would encourage you to spend some time this week even uh, meditating and memorizing and spending some time in, in these powerful verses. Titus it says, But when the goodness... And loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. He saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. What's it mean to receive it? Uh, next weekend will be my 11th uh, wedding anniversary. 
Danielle and I will have been married for 11 years. Praise God for that. And when I, when I asked her to marry me, I got down on a knee and I did the whole thing. I actually was in a field in Colorado and snuck my brother into the field. And he shot off fireworks. And it was this really dramatic thing until the field caught on fire and it was a big deal. And every, <clears throat> It wasn't my best moment. But I feel like it symbolized who I was going to be as a husband. So really good intentions, but then things catch on fire. <clears throat> I asked my wife to marry me, and she said yes. I invited her to marry me. I, I, I told her, made a covenant with her, I'm going to lay my life down for you. I'm going to love you the way Christ loves the church. And I, I do a very imperfect job of that, but that's the covenant I stepped into. That is, that is what I committed to. She accepted that. She received that. It has changed both of our lives in really, really beautiful ways. God is so much better than any husband this world has to offer. The, the offer that he extends to us, we receive it, we surrender to that. It's an incredible thing. Have you received that in your life? Maybe you know someone who's still yet to receive that and you're praying for them this morning. When we ask this question of, well, how, how good do I have to be? We need the grace of God. Have we received it? It's the only hope we have. And then finally, finally we respond. We respond. We've admitted this. We've received this. And then we have to respond. And responding to God's grace with love and obedience. So <clears throat> if you're like me in this room, I grew up in the church. I love it. I wouldn't have traded it for the world. I have heard this sermon a thousand times. I've preached this sermon or some version of it. Hundreds of times. Share it with my sons all the time. This gospel, this good news. So when I talk about how we respond to this, um, I think here's a little bit of my fear, and it certainly comes from a little bit of a pattern in my life. What a tragedy it would be if we hear this sermon, and we hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we've heard it a hundred times, and we nod our head, and we think, yep. And the gospel of Jesus Christ becomes white noise in our life. And we're no longer moved and transformed. It no longer becomes the soil for the rest of our life. What if we make the mistake of turning the gospel into the starting blocks for the race that we run instead of what the gospel is, which is the entire race that we run with Jesus? The death, burial, and resurrection, the fact that his righteousness is given to me and he is my only hope, that's not how I began my relationship with Christ. It's how I maintain it. It's how I grow. It's how I mature. So when, when we say respond, I think this is for believers. If you've heard this sermon a thousand times, would you ask the Spirit of God, Lord, give me a fresh, give me a fresh, deeper view. Would the soil of the gospel become richer and richer and richer? Because it is the soil in which change comes from. It is the soil where peace in your life comes from. The fruit of the Spirit, where joy in your life comes from. Would it not become white noise? Would it not become, oh, right, the gospel, we've heard it. Would we be transformed by it? Would we lean into it and think, oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus that moves us. I think this good news that we can't do it on our own and we need Jesus, I think it is the most applicable truth. It's the most Monday morning relevant thing we could, we could talk about from a pulpit. Because tomorrow morning when I wake up, I don't need the 2.0 gospel I don't need the next steps. I don't need, okay, well, I've accepted and received him, and so now I can move on to other varsity Christians. I need to bring myself back to the soil that I can't do it on my own, and it's only by his grace. What does that look like? What does it look like for this, this truth to be Monday morning applicable? What does it look like for application for something like this? Here's one thing it might look like. It might look like resting in his grace. So are you, are you still striving? Are there areas in your life that I would pray the Spirit of God reveals and says, look, you're still striving. You're still trying to earn this thing that I've given you. Why are you striving? You're, you're writing a tithe check in order to buy something as opposed to in response to something. You're serving diligently to earn something as opposed to a response to something. Are you still striving? Or are you resting in his grace? And in resting in his grace, there is such freedom and there is such security when we look at Matthew 7, we don't grow anxious when we see Matthew 7, Lord, Lord, depart from me, I never knew you. 
we see because when our Easter egg is open, we get to rest in the grace of God and it wasn't about what we did. And so we don't read that anxiously. We read that with hope because we know what our hope is in. If there are patterns of sin in your life, the gospel becomes the soil in which freedom from those sin patterns begin because we see his kindness and scripture says his kindness leads me to repentance. Not just, well, I'm gonna be better. I just need to be better. I just need to work harder. I just need to be more disciplined. No, I see his kindness and it moves me to repentance. Another, another application, another way it might look, it might look like radical obedience. Like I just said, if this is how the God of the universe loves us and he loves us not because of what we did, well, then that response looks like radical obedience. Then that's, that's where I become a person who radically serves with his time. That's where I become a person who radically tithes because I realize that this isn't buying me anything. It's, it's because he loved me and it's all his. It's why I obey and follow him, not to earn it, but to respond to it. So often we put the cart before the horse. Don't we? We, we think we've got to do these things in order to earn his love. And the reality is, no, no, he loves us. He loves us right where we're at. He loves us. Because of that, I want to serve him. I want to give him my life. I, I want my life to be his because look how he loves me. This is a God I want to lay down my life for. Why does he love us like that? Why does the God of the universe Friends, why does he love us like that? I do not know. I do not know, but I am blown away by his grace, and I want to continue to be blown away by his grace. I don't want my heart to grow cold to this grace. I don't want to skip past the grace of God and move on to other things. And so the last thing of what I think it looks like to respond is it looks like worship. It looks like worship. We sing, oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus and that comes not from a place of, I'm going to sing loud to impress my God. It comes from a place of, oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Who am I? Who am I? Why would he, why would he rescue me? You don't know me. I know me. I'm a 35-year-old sinner. I have pride and selfishness and greed and all these idolatry in my heart, ways that I want to glorify myself over God. Why would the God of the universe come and say, but I still love you, Ben. I still, I still love you and I love you right where you are and I'm calling you to obedience. Yeah, I'm calling you to walk out some of that and mature out of some of that, but I love you right where you are. Does that stir our affections for worship? We sing about the gratitude from a place of response. And is it this daily joy that we get to walk around with? Would the gospel not become white noise? Would it become the, the melody in which we worship to throughout our day? Maybe you're hearing this and you're not all in in Christ. Maybe you're hearing this and, and you have yet to put your faith in Christ. Or maybe you're hearing this and the Spirit of God is revealing in you, you've just been performing You've just been signed up for the religion, but you have never really surrendered yourself to Christ. Praise the Lord that you're here. You might still have questions that need to be wrestled with. Great. You might still have some doubts. But I also believe it's no accident that you're here, and I think the Spirit of God is wooing you, saying, Come home. I have called you to something better, and all of your striving has led you nowhere. Come home. Son, come home. Daughter, you are mine. Come home. Christ Chapel, do you know how much you are loved by the God of the universe? Do you know the price that was paid for you? And those who are in Christ get to stand on the edge of eternity. And when we are opened like that egg, we don't have to be anxious. Because we know we bring nothing to the table, but God's grace is on our life. And we get to have confidence. Because we're not claiming our works, we're claiming the blood of Jesus Christ. We can't be good enough. We can't be good enough. We have to rely on the perfection of Jesus instead. Praise God that the answer to the question, how good do you have to be, is Jesus. Praise God that the answer to the question, am I going to be enough? Am I going to live a life worthy? The answer to that question is Jesus, and he has made himself available, and would I never grow callous to that? Would we never grow callous to that? Let me pray over you and then let us respond in worshiping. Father, 
Thank you for how you love us. Thank you that you are a God who, while we were yet sinners, died for us. Lord, we are so grateful for this gospel. We're so grateful for the answer to the question, how good do we have to be? The exhaustion of trying to be good enough, Lord, um, it wears us down. So, Lord, would we walk in the freedom that you have purchased for us? And, God, would our lives respond to that? Truly, Lord, would they respond to that? Would our worship come from this place? You loved us first, and for that, we are so grateful. In the name of Jesus, amen.